name is Mike. I'm one of the pastors here. It's an honor to be with you this morning. Thank you for coming. It's a, it's a great to worship with you and be with you this morning. My, I was looking at this passage and I was thinking back on my life uh, about what story about my life could help give some color to what we're about to jump into. Chapter 4 is all about lost hope and, and redemption. And I was thinking about when was one of the most hopeless moments in my life. And I was thinking about there's, there's a few sections in my life that have been harder, and I've told you about them. And I thought, I'll, uh, I'll go back to ancient history. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away, I, I used to be a RA and a hall director. And as a way to kind of help grease the wheels of administration, I would sign up for watching the dorms during winter break because we had this large conference we all went to. And so I would spend a couple weeks, uh, two weeks it felt like, alone in the dorms of no one else, just watching huge million dollar buildings. And I remember walking along just thinking about my life. And there was, the holidays were weird for people that wrestled. Uh, you usually, it's feasting, it's fun, it's fellowship, it's stuff like that. But for people that wrestled in high school and college, it's a time of famine. It's a time of skipping weight, not really being excited to go hang out with people because you have to keep your weight down. Um, I won't go into the deep, deep hole of weeks with malnourishment, but I remember one year I got really dark. I got really dark to the point where I was contemplating taking my own life. I was contemplating hopelessness to the point where I'm like, this is it. It was selfish, it was immature, and I was legalistically judging myself based on other things. And there's a whole lot I could say about that, but it would distract us of the main point of what we're talking about today. Human existence gets hard. It gets hard. Um, whatever it is that is pushing you up to that, cl that cliff of hopelessness, that is a real thing in the human existence. And David, when he walked through chapter 4 of Ruth and wrote out um, this story about where do you put your hope in when you're in a hopeless situation? Where is your hope? Is it in sporting? Is it in your mental you know, strength? Is it in your financial strength? Is it in your relational strength? Is it in a, is it in a relationship with that guy or that girl? Is it in your future? Is your hope in your past? We all have things that we, if our back's against the wall, we take refuge during the hard parts of life because we think at the end of the day, I can hang my hat on this. I can really trust and rely on that. And I propose to you if it's anything but the redemptive work of Christ, that hope will fail you. Where is your hope, church? I've titled this message, From Bitter to Blessed, thinking about just the, the culmination of the entire book of Ruth as we bring it to a close this morning, From Bitter to Blessed, from chapter 1 to chapter 4. In the, the, the main movements of the text, verses 1 through 12, I see a cost of redemption, verses 1 through 12, the cost of redemption, verses 13 through 17, I see the fullness of redemption. In verses 18 through 22, we see the finality of redemption. If you'd bow your heads with me, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for today. I thank you for the great hope we can sing about. I thank you for the great hope we have in Christ. I thank you for um, we live a life that's got challenges in our life, God, but we have you, the overcomer of all of our challenges, Lord. We need you to be that great hope once again today. I pray that we would Put our focus in you, those of us who might have drifted from our one true, pure hope, Lord. And those of, those of us who do not know you, Lord, I pray that they would put their hope in you today. You're a redemptive God who is in the people-saving, people-changing, hope-giving business. I ask that you just really restore and renew our minds in your great word today. We thank you for the word of God. I ask that you do work in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ruth chapter 4, verse 1, if you'd read and follow along with me, I will read it for us as we unpack it. So the cost of redemption is what the main point of this first 12 verses, the cost of redemption. So let's look at that cost. Ruth, chapter 4, verse 1. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And so if you were here last week, we've been walking through Naomi and Ruth and their, their journey they've been on from a bitter, hard land of death and destruction and starvation to this climax of the story. Chapter 1, they left the promised land, the land of God. They went to live in a foreign land, and all the wheels came off. There was death and destruction, famine. Um, it's just been a sad chapter 1. Chapter 2, uh, faith starts to grow, hope starting to grow. In chapter 2, as, 
as Ruth gleans the fields and makes the connection to Boaz and his men, and she's starting to bring in food to provide for her, her substance for her and Naomi because she is starving. And Naomi is starving. They need substance. Chapter 3, uh, basically we look at Ruth's proposal to Boaz, asking him to come in and be their redeemer, their kinsman redeemer, to restore their financial situation of where they're at because they're widowed, um, homeless, uh, poor, living paycheck to paycheck off of gleaning fields. Josh, Lincoln, and I have been working through that. So chapter 4 is the morning after the proposal. And that's where we pick up today. He said, I will make it right with Ruth. I will get it done today. And so it's the next morning we see Boaz, who's a man of standing, who's a man of influence, who's a man of valor, a man of character, who's an impressive man. He finds this guy and he calls him friends in your Bible, most likely. Uh, if you look at the exact Hebrew rendering of that word, it doesn't say his name. And the Bible's big on names. There's genealogy. It doesn't, like, doesn't dance around when it says names. David, the author of this book, said, Boaz saw friend, or it's translated so-and-so. They purposely leave this man's name out, which is interesting. I will not camp there the entire time, but I like to just kind of have a little color and context of what we're looking at. So, like, why no name? Why is David omitting a name of the potential first and closest redeemer to fix this situation? Uh, why is David snubbing this man's name from being in the Bible, uh, from Scripture? I propose to you that Bethlehem is between 300 to 1,000 people, is what historians say at this time. And he's a closer relative than Boaz. And his brother's wife is estranged, and this foreign woman is living there. I propose to you, this man knows the plight of Naomi and Ruth. He knows what's been going on, and I think he's been running the clock out. Uh, but Boaz is trying to keep things classy, and he's attempting to make this man make a decision. Because indecision is a decision when someone's running out of life. They're running out of income. They're in trouble. And Boaz is calling this man out in front of ten of the elders, we'll see here in the next verse, and is keeping things classy. If you want to see, like, what do you mean keeping things classy? If you want to flip to Deuteronomy 25, 1 through 10, I'll just summarize it for you. Um, the woman is supposed to go to the man who is not doing his job of redeeming and restoring this family, of buying up their land and providing for them, not just an heir, but physical provision for them. And she's supposed to, like, you know, call him out. She's supposed to do everything he's doing right now. And she's supposed to take his sandal, and I believe it says she's supposed to, like, spit in his face, I believe, from me reading this earlier this week. Um, it's very not ideal situation. So Boaz is trying to help bridge that gap and answer the the scripture and fulfill the law to providing protection provision for these two women that are in need of assistance. I think you should notice that God's law cares about the plight of the poor, the plight of those who are in need, the plight of women. We see provision and protection for women in God's law. Look with me at verse 2. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. And they sat down there. And so the city gate is a place where, like, the local ju judgment of Bethlehem, the local town hall, the city square, that's where judicial and legal things happen. Marriages happen there. Land transfers happens there. And he needs to have ten witnesses at the gate for that to be a legit thing uh, in the eyes of the city. Uh, it's a quorum of enough presence, men of standing, men of leadership. Uh, but he's just walking around. He's like, hey, you sit down. Come here. Come here, come here, sit down. I mean, it just kind of shows Boaz has some, some clout. He's got some respect. This man has, uh, he's got some riz, and they listen to him. All right, Mike, stop trying, Pastor, I know. Uh, verse 3, and then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the land of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belongs to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here. And in the presence of the elders of my people, if you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me, and I, that I may know, that I may know, for there is no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. So Boaz here is sort of legally serving this man papers, if that makes sense. He's making this man make a decision about what he's going to do with Naomi and Ruth. It's just it's a, an opportunity for this man to have a land grab and expand his wealth um, if he can run out the clock for Naomi to die. But we see in verse 5, after the man says, I will redeem it, 
We see in verse 5, Then Boaz says, The day you buy the field from the land of Naomi, you will also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to per perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Once this man hears about Ruth's economic picture, Ruth's part of the deal, everything changes in this man's opinion. Instead of taking care of Naomi, who's past her childbearing years, he has this young, vibrant, ethnic woman who's there. And he knows that if he redeems both of them, he's required by law to provide a son or provide, attempt to provide a child for her. The time and money commitment uh, increases, and he has to provide an heir for Elimelech, for Naomi, and Mylon, for Ruth. And who knows how many kids Ruth might have in the coming years. And those, all the time and all the money he invests with Ruth and Naomi, all of that goes to the descendants of Ruth and Naomi to carry on the name of Ruth's deceased husband. Even though he's likely already married, uh, this does not relieve him of the responsibility to redeem, redeem Ruth and Naomi. We see here the cost of redemption is too high for this man. Let me pick up in verse 6. Then the Redeemer said, Great, I'll redeem Ruth, too. Is that what it says in your Bible? No. No, he doesn't say that. He says, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. And that is when Boaz continues to show his true colors. Boaz, Boaz was, you know, he's about to get the girl. We've been watching this love story bloom and blossom for a couple weeks now. And you're like, Bo, what are you doing, Bo? Bo, don't, don't let him almost get the girl. This is the, feels like a Bible Hallmark movie we're watching here. <laughs> it would have been fine if that man redeemed her. Because Boaz was more concerned about the law of God being fulfilled and Ruth and Naomi being provided for than him getting the girl. He cared for God's will to play out more than his own will. Do you see how Boaz's stock, his biblical stock, just keeps climbing? Boaz cared about the law of God more than the relationship with Ruth. Remember, this is the time of Judges when every man did what he wanted to do. That was the last verse in the last book. And the whole last book, if you want to read a, a very dark and depressing book with gospel hope in there, but Judges is one of the most brutalist books in the Old Testament to walk through. There's a lot of evil men doing evil things. And you see a lot of victim happening to females and just tribes and war and rape. And it's brutal. Judges is a brutal book in the Old Testament. And here we see Boaz. Boaz did not want to fulfill his own desires like a lot of the other people living at this time. He wanted to fulfill God's law and God's will in this situation. He wanted to obey and fulfill the law of God to the best of his abilities. Boaz's happiness takes a back seat to Elimelech and Kilion and Mylon's names being redeemed, and the land being redeemed, and Ruth and Naomi being redeemed, and a son to carry on that name of a dead Israelite to, to continue their nation into the history of Israel. It's very impress impressive that Boaz cares about God's will and God's law more than his will. But the cost of redemption is high for Boaz on many levels. And Boaz, we'll see as we walk through this, he's willing to pay each of those costs. Verse 7, now this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, the one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the matter of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it yourself, he drew off his sandal. It's sort of like the sandal was a physical symbol or a sign to people watching that uh, a title of land was exchanged as someone took off a sandal and handed it to the other person. He took off his sandal and handed it to him. It was a visible representation to those watching that land was exchanging hands. But the cost of redemption was high. Boaz pays dearly for his, his dear bride, Ruth. Boaz pays dearly for everything that occurs in the rest of this few verses here. This was not a cheap endeavor or a Black Friday deal Boaz is jumping in on. Boaz is paying full price, and he paid in full for the cost of redeeming Ruth. This payment cost Boaz dearly, just like Christ's payment. I'm going to make a few of those connections in this passage. Just like Christ's payment paid in full, and the cross was a dear price for Christ to pay for us. 
Look with me at verses 9. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belongs to Elimelech and all that belongs to Kilion and Mylon. Also Ruth the Moabite and the widow of Mylon I have bought to be my wife to per 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 uh, per perpetuate the name of the dead and in his inheritance that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers. And from the gate of this native place, you are my witnesses this day. So we start to see some of the reasons why Boaz is obeying God's law and redeeming and paying the high cost of redemption. So it's not just, not just the financial cost, not just the financial implications of kids and inheritance, but those kids that Ruth has couldn't lay a claim to his current inheritance which is something that Boaz is okay with. But there's a, there's a reality to this, what is happening here in this marriage that you might not realize. Uh, Boaz is Jewish and Ruth is a Moabite. They are not the same ethnicity. There's a personal cost for Boaz. These kids won't look like him. I don't know if you all are in multi-ethnic marriages. I had a moment in my life where I'm like, you know, these children will not look like me. I've seen my siblings get married to other, other white people. <laughs> and those other white people look like my kids, my siblings' kids. I'm like, you know, we're white people. We're just kind of genetic blank slates. And my family's even more of a, I'm like, my kids are going to have some ethnicity to them. You know, which is just, a, there's a cost to that as this marriage that Ruth is associating with. But, but Boaz might have, I'm just speculating, he might have thought of that. Um, but there's also a cost to that about how he describes the situation. He says, I'm doing this for the dying men he lists off. He lists it off. He desires to fulfill the law of God, and that's unusual. He wants to save dead men's name for being forgotten. It's not the only reason, but it's the reason he leads with. His sons and daughters will not carry his last name. They won't look like him. They'll cost um, money from his, from his current world that he's working with. There's a, there's a relational cost to having kids in your home that don't have your last name and don't look like you. And he's walking through that in front of the watching city is watching this play out, the cost Boaz is willing to pay to redeem Ruth. I remember with my dear bride when we first started to get engaged and married and gone public with our dating life. It's a big decision. You don't know how to articulate that as a young guy. And so they said, like, Mike, you're dating Annie. I'm like, yes, you're engaged. That happened, like, right away. Yes. <laughs> and they said, why? You, why'd you fall for Annie? What got you? And I, and I said, well, she loves Jesus more than me. I said that a few times. And people are like, that's weird. I'm like, yeah, okay, let me, let me workshop this. I'm like, well, I played off of my friend Alex. Uh, I was like, you know, I said, well, she's hot. She's, <laughs> she's my caramel delight, beautiful bride. And they're like, all right, that makes more sense. But people's eyes would get big when I said, well, she loves the Lord more than me. Uh, that's one of the first things I noticed about my wife. <laughs> I believe my wife is adorable. Uh, but her love for the Lord is also adorable. But as you, are as you articulate your decisions for why you are doing what you are doing as a man, that matters. And Boaz is explaining his thought process of honoring the word of God and honoring those who have dead and God's desires for carrying on their name of what God has given the people of God in the book of Deuteronomy 25. And he has a real platform, a real testimony to his neighbors, his network, and also the nations. If you think of his wife, he's marrying. He's a real example to the city of Bethlehem and all those young men and women and all those older men and women watching him obey the word of God in front of them. He wants to be known and obey God's law and bring glory to God in little ways and in big ways, no matter the cost of redemption. Verse 11, then all the people who were at the gate that were watching this happen, the elders said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make this woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in, in Ephra, Ephraim and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, who Tamar bore to Judah because of the offspring that the Lord will give to you by this young woman. The community of Bethlehem see the cost of redemption. The community of Bethlehem see the hope growing of a life being redeemed. In verse 1 through 12, we see the cost of redemption. Verses 13 through 17, we see the fullness of redemption. 
So look with me at verse 13. Now Boaz took Ruth and she became his wife and he went into her and the Lord gave her conception and she bore a son. So there's no wedding here in Ruth. Uh, there is a, a marriage, but there's not a lot of emphasis on a wedding. I know in our culture, we get really cheap with how we invest in our marriages, uh, but we spare no expense for weddings. We get it really backwards. We spend 20, 30 grand on a three hour event, but then people look at me and I'm like, what? I'm not going to spend money on count marriage counseling. I'm not going to go to a count conference and talk about 20 bucks for a conference. Are you serious? <laughs> Men and women, I don't, I don't think we realize how stupid we can be as a culture. Is that fair? I'm not saying they didn't have a good party, but I'm saying the emphasis on what we're seeing in the text is a marriage that is occurring. A marriage. Eventually, men and women, uh, just a word to people getting married, the honeymoon phase will wear off and reality sets in. Couples spend a fortune pre-gaming and they spend a little, little bit of time and money investing in the actual game of marriage. I remember I was at, a, I think any of I, you know, I've been to like 12 or 15 different marriage conferences. Like, Mike, it's because you're a pastor. No, I wasn't working them. I was <laughs> attending them. Um, and I remember there's like, we were at that Weekend to Remember thing in downtown Lincoln this last year, scouting it out. And they say like, stand up if you've been married for a day or less. And this couple got married that morning and they stood up and that was their honeymoon. We're like, okay, all right. There's, and then they said, all right, stand up if you've been married 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years, 60 years, 60, 61, 62, 60. And he went like a salesman raising the price till one grandparent couple sat down and another grandparent couple stayed standing and they're holding each other, and it's incredibly sweet and dear, and you're like, just let them sit down right now. And it was, <laughs> but it was, it's amazing, it's amazing to see that sweet couple and all those sweet couples walking around, still investing in their marriage and still putting skin in the game on what is happening. God believes in marriages. The Bible believes in marriages. Boaz and Ruth, I believe, had a great marriage. And you might not have had a lights out Instagram, vain, post, post worthy wedding ceremony, but they had an amazing marriage. I think, it's a, I think it's fitting to think, do you dream about your wedding day or your marriage? Do you dream about your wedding day more or your marriage more? I mean, we're in a culture that's just stupid, okay? Don't be stupid, Christians. You heard sower. We could be smart. All right, so it says, he went into her. And so... That's the last domino we see laid out for the fulfillment of a marriage. It's the physical side. Now, we cannot isolate this in a marriage. The spiritual union, the emotional union, the relational in front of the friends and family, vows exchange thing that we see in our culture, the social context of marriage, and then last we see the physical. Pastor would say you leave, you cleave, and then you interweave, which is an appropriate process. But again, our culture is stupid. Statistically, I can prove that. Stories, I can prove that. Our culture gets everything upside down and backwards. Our culture is so evil with sexuality, which should be the last thing on the table becomes the first thing on the table. Before our friends and family know your name, I'm going to sleep with you. Before our friends and family know you exist, I'll move in for a weekend. Do you see how backwards and upside down we are? how stupid our culture makes us. And whenever we talk about culture, we got to think about culture. It's, it's everywhere, and it's hard to realize what's around you. It's, it's described in a book I read about, like, um, fish and water. You're like, fish and water, culture is everywhere. I can't see the stupidness, the depravity, the evilness of our culture where everyone's doing what they want, like the time of Judges. Think about if you're a fish and you're living in salt water. You don't really know what fresh water is like. And if you're one of those cold water fishes, you don't really know what warm water is like. And if you're one of those dirty water fishes, you don't know what clear water is like. You don't know your culture until you're pulled out of your culture and dropped in a different culture. Our culture in the United States of America in the year 2024 is incredibly sexually depraved, incredibly evil, just like in the time of Judges where everyone's doing whatever they want. And women are not safe, children are not safe, Marriage is not viewed highly. Sexuality is abused. Our culture is destroying bodies, people, marriage, relationships, everything. I've, I walk through pre-marriage counseling with a lot of our couples at our church, like many of us different pastors help out. And 
I just, the goal is that you're fully known and fully loved in your marriage. Where all your secrets are out, you're fully forgiven. Where your past is exposed and you're fully accepted. No partial truth shared, but full truth shared. I think I've sat through 80 plus marriage counseling sessions, pre-marriage counseling sessions. There's some gut-wrenching things that people can do to each other. Some very tear-jerking things of what God can do to redeem men and women and re restore relationships together. But you've got to realize that our culture is trying to kill you. It's trying to kill your faith. It's trying to kill your walk of God. It's trying to kill your relationship with God and your relationship with the people of God. It's trying to kill your relationship with your leaving and cleaving and interweaving. We, we're going to look at stuff, but what is the, the end result of this physical union between Boaz and Ruth? We see, we see a child is born in Bethlehem. His name is Obed. You and I are like, that's not Christmas time, Mike. A child is born. Those babies are only born in December. No, that's... <laughs> Jesus was born in Bethlehem, but that's in December. Obed was born in Bethlehem. Look at me at verses 14. Then the woman said to Naomi... They spoke in chapter 1. No, Naomi spoke to the women in chapter 1, and now the women are speaking to Naomi in chapter 4. This is where the bitter to bless theme comes in. May, then the woman said to Naomi, May, Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a Redeemer, and may his name be renewed in Israel, renowned in Israel. He shall be a restorer of life, a nourisher of your old age for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons has given you birth to him. So seven sons from 1 Samuel 2 and Job chapter 1 is an indication of God's blessing. Just notice God blesses this newly married couple with a child. Children are a blessing. They're not the only blessing in the Bible, but they are a blessing. God says to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. In the blessing of the covenant people living in the promised land, God gives Boaz and Ruth a future generations of people to dwell in God's promised land to be image bearers and examples and lights to the watching world about what it's like to have a relationship with God. We see the responsibility of provision and protection put on the adults in this story. He provided for and protected Ruth and Naomi. He's protecting and providing for this child in the prime years of their life. And then later in verse 15, we see the roles being flipped and how when children grow old, their, their young care for them. If you think you have an aging father or mother and you're like, what do I do with mom or dad? That's a real thing. Um, the only example that I like to talk about in the Bible, one of the main examples is Joseph told his dad in Canaan, come up here to Egypt, send this cart, get dad, he's old, bring him up here to Egypt. And Joseph took care of his dad in his later years of life. Joseph did not move to Canaan to take care of his dad. I know we're in a college town with a lot of young people. Mom and dad don't live here. I know that. Verse 16. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on, his, on her lap and became his nurse. So there's a potential legal role in the upbringing of this grandson as a substitute son. Uh, could be interpreted as an adoption ceremony. Verse 17. And the woman of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, Oh, oh son has been born to Naomi. His name is Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the, the father of David. What a change from chapter 1 to chapter 4 for both Ruth and Naomi. We see this redemptive journey from bitter to blessed. We see in chapter 1 hopelessness and bitterness. We see in chapter 2 finding faith, finding favor. We see chapter 3 hope and rest growing. And in chapter 4, four we see a fulfillment of hope found in redemption. They were lost and they became found. They were bitter, they became sweet. They were sorrowful, they got full of laughter. They were empty, they became full. There was a famine, then there was a harvest, there was death, and then there's life. To bring roof to a full circle and to a close, we see ordinary story of extraordinary meaning of men and women trying to be found faithful to God. We see the fullness of redemption. And here in the last few verses, we see the finality of redemption. We have one redeeming hope, Christian. We see the finality of redemption here in these last few verses. Now, these are the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron. Hezron fathered Ram. Ram fathered Aminadad. Aminadad fathered Nashon. 
Nashon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. Lincoln told us in week one that David was the author of this book. I agree with that. David wrote this book for a political purpose, for propaganda. When King David came to power after the death of Saul, you could have read about in the, previous, the next few books, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings. There's seven and a half years in David's life where he is reigning and ruling over one tribe of Israel, not all 12 tribes. There's 11 tribes that don't know what he's up to. In those seven and a half years of David's reign over the tribes of Judah, it's more likely he had to answer a lot of questions from leading elders of the 11 tribes, even questions about his true nationality as a true Israelite. My pastor friend shared me his notes, and I'm using his analogy here. But remember the debate about President Barack Obama about if he was born in the United States? Okay, they do. The story of Ruth is David's similar answer to a question on David's legitimacy and his Israelite nationality. The book of Ruth proves David is an Israelite through and through. In his lineage, we see the importance of families and the key role redemption plays in King David existing. Not just his existing, but into the future. We know that David had Solomon. Solomon had a whole list of characters which led to Jesus being born in Bethlehem. We know that on our side of the Bible. Boaz redeemed David's great-grandmother. When God's redemption is involved, God can change family's lineage. When God's redemption is involved, God can change a sad story and make it a resolved, redemptive story. Ruth, chapter 1, is a sad story of the lost family who's losing its lineage and dying off in a foreign land. In Ruth, chapter 4, verses 22, we see God dramatically turning a tragic story around to King David, who led the largest superpower in the world at that time, at the end of his reign. And we also know King Jesus comes in that lineage. Ruth ends with a remember of the, a remembry of the dead and the families being redeemed, and that God is a God of the end game, the final score. Death brings a finality onto everything. You very likely did not go to a funeral this last week because you wanted to, but because someone died. You didn't just sneak into the back of a cemetery service and watch someone else's funeral. You don't walk through funerals because the cemeteries because that's not a desirable thing for our culture. Death brings a brutal finality to everything. When all is said and done, at your funeral, your friends and your family will talk about what you are known, publicly and privately. Those closest to you who live the longest with you, what do they think of you at your funeral? There's a permanence in death, a, a closure in death. The last chapter of Ruth is the last chapter all of us will face. A lineup of people who had a testimony before God and their friends and family. But I love that we serve a God who has a finality in his redemption. He's not just a good God for the first day, he's a great God for the last day. The day you will stand face to face with your judge or your redeemer. So as we close, you have, you will, or you are walking through hard, hopeless situations in life. You can find hope in that Boaz is a picture of a future redeemer. Ruth is a, a story about redeeming love of Christ. Boaz was Ruth's kinsman and her redeemer. He was related to her. He was her kinsman. So Christ became one of us to do what he did. Boaz shared his life with a penniless alien and outsider and brought her in. Christ shared his life for us penniless aliens, outsiders, and brought us in. Boaz provided for Ruth, his bride, a future and a hope. Christ provided for us, his bride, a future and a hope. Obed. Obed's birth foreshadows the birth of Christ. The townswoman would bring glad tidings to Naomi. At the birth of Christ, angels announced and shepherds brought glad tidings to Israel about hope lying in a manger. The townswoman named Ruth, Ruth's child Obed. Mary named her child Jesus, who would save his people from their sins. 
Obed is the future hope of Naomi. He's called her redeemer. Christ is our future hope. He's our redeemer. Obed is expected to feed Naomi in her later years. Christ is the bread of life for us in these years. Obed's birth comes with great expectations, and Christ's birth came with even greater expectations. Obed is called a restorer of fullness and life. He brought life and restored restoration to Naomi. Christ came that we might have life more abundantly. Church, we serve a God who is in the redeeming, people-changing, life-altering business. I think that's an amazing God we sing to, we pray to, and we get to think about. So if you'd bow your heads to me, let's pray. Lord, I thank you for the story of Ruth. I thank you for your God who has paid the cost. Your God who has paid it in full. And your God who is there on the final day when we have to give an account for all the thoughts, words, and deeds we've ever done in our entire life. God, I ask that you just continue to grow faith in all of us, Lord. Those of us who know this story and know about redemption, I pray we'd see it afresh. We'd appreciate it afresh as we step into communion, Lord. And those of us who do not know this God that Ruth got to know, those of us who do not know this God of Boaz, this God of Jesus Christ, I pray that they would ask questions and continue to engage with you, Lord. I thank you for the chance of repentance and redemption, Lord. I pray that we'd be a church that is found faithful in both those areas. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.